he has. Um, much better on the snooker. But if you keep going, it's kind of an interesting thing. If you keep putting one foot in front of the other and in front of the other, you actually get somewhere. It's not always where you'd really like to go, but you get somewhere. Instead of standing there, well, I mustn't do anything. Well, they're all, no, don't call me mad. I don't give a shit if you call me mad. This is me, and this is all I can be. And you actually get somewhere, and you start to see that you don't have to follow the sheep in front. You can express your own uniqueness. Even if you are in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. Wonderful saying. And it's when people say, but everyone knows that, mate. Like this, well, everyone knows the earth's flat, mate. Well, here's one less than everyone. I don't know that. And it, again, we, we follow the herd instead of standing up for what we believe is right. We're not always right, but it's what we believe is right. And when you start to do that, and you start to lift your head and look beyond the norm, you find that so many things in the world that appear on first hearing to be, oh, that's a bit bizarre and extreme, isn't it? Turn out to be elephants in the living room. Staring us in the face, it's obvious. But as we'll get to in the last part of the talk, it's only obvious if we can break out the programming that tells us it's not obvious, that tells us black is white and white is black. The key thing, and this is what I'm going to be doing today, is connecting dots. When I started researching this uh, from the early 90s, I was staggered at how many different areas of subject I was being pulled into to understand what was happening in the world. And on the news, you get the dots. You don't even get what's really happening in the bloody dots, to be honest. But they, they cover the dots. When you start connecting them, different people and organizations and events that appear on the surface to be completely unconnected, whoa, there's suddenly a picture that makes perfect sense of the world, whereas it didn't before. This is a famous uh, quote. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as self-evident. Oh, I always thought that Ike bloke was talking sense. I did, honest. What, when you're saying he was mad? Yeah, I wouldn't mean it. And the thing is, all truth is an exaggeration, but a lot of truth goes through this sequence. And the point is, unless you accept the ridicule when you first talk about it, and therefore keep talking about it, unless you accept the uh, condemnation and other opposition and keep talking about it, you never get to stage three where it's accepted as self-evident. And this is the challenge when we're talking about things that are not accepted by the mainstream. Keep talking, keep uh, giving it out no matter what the reaction, and then eventually the reaction changes because it becomes self-evident. Now, here's an elephant in the living room. I love this one. Anyone can become President of the United States. Okay, let me give you that. Let me just rephrase that. Anyone who hasn't got two brain cells to rub together, anyone who's a pedophile abuser of children, all these people, all these people, yeah, they can become President of the United States, but people who don't get into that stuff, where are they? You know, there's people. How many people are there in the America now? Best part of 300 million. And there's some wonderful people in America. There's some intelligent people in America who would be here today if this was in America. Who, who can see it. They don't become president of the United States. A handful of uh, bloodline families become president. And my goodness, interbreeding, not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> Uncle Ron. This guy, this guy was having uh, problems uh, in terms of bewilderment while he was president of the United States. It didn't bloody matter because he wasn't president. George Bush was. I think that we can find more intelligent people to be president of the United States. Then he was followed by this guy. It's like when you go, you get too close to it. Oh, what do you think is going to be president? What do you think? What do you think? Who's going to be president? Do you think about that Kerry? Do you think about that Bush? Take a deep breath. Take a step back, look at it again. Ah, it's a piece of shit. Yes, that's all it is. 
walk away. There we go. Child abuser, mass killer. Oh my goodness, he's got a CV, this guy. Uh, President of the United States. And he's got his Dumbo son there as well now. Then we, we had Slick Will. Yes, a man you can trust. It says here. Um, this was Clinton, the early years. You know, he's getting well groomed for it. I love Bill. I love you. There you go. He loves it, Ronnie. Bill, President of the United States, great man. And then there's the Clinton Memorial in the mall. That's that one. That's the new one, just putting it being put up. Look. So, yeah, anyone can become President of the United States. Absolutely bloody anyone. If, you know, if, if, if anyone wants confirmation that the whole system of electing presidents, prime ministers come to that, is rigged, well, I give, I give you my case, lock, stock and barrel. Spot the brain cell? No. And, uh, this is, now, this is prophecy. H.L. Mencken, 1880 to 1956. As democracy is perfected, the office of president represents more and more closely the inner soul of the people. On some great and glorious day, the plain folks of the land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be adorned by a downright moron. Now that is prophecy. Whoa. How can it happen? Because it's rigged. This man is president of the United States. They tell me it's the most powerful office in the world. I laugh when they tell me, but they tell me that's what it is. There we go. Why help never arrived. <laughs> I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Line's gone dead. Love it. I've read, I've read, and I understand the world. <laughs> laugh. I thought I'd never start when he got elected. I didn't. Oh, I love this one. Notice that, look. Oh, you're taking a, you're taking a foreign language, little, little girl. Honestly. What a... That's a great one. I know how hard it is to put food on your family. This guy's taking us to war. Families is where our nation finds hope, where wings take dream. Redefining the role of the United States from enable us to keep the peace to enable us to keep the peace from peacekeepers is going to be an assignment. It's your money. You paid for it. The war on terror involves Saddam Hussein because of the nature of Saddam Hussein, the history of Saddam Hussein, and his willingness to terrorize himself. Sorry, I've got Twitch going. Is our children learning? I love this one. My favorite. <laughs> President of the United States who has led the world so far into two wars with more on the agenda. And it doesn't matter who follows him, it's the same story, answerable to the same force, advancing the same agenda. We live in one party state masquerading as freedom and democracy. I give you my case for that in this country. Yeah, I heard from a very, very good source, as they say, in all the best places this week, uh, very, very good, um, that he is definitely the chosen one, David Cameron, and that uh, the health of Tony Blair is seriously worse than we're, the, we're being told publicly. And he's being groomed to take over. And when he takes over, there will be no decipherable difference. The agenda goes on because... These are puppets of the same force, whatever color their rosette may say. And all the time, 
we are being fed the movie version of reality so that we buy what they want us to believe or we buy what they want us to believe so that we will see the world in the desired fashion. This is the latest clone human apparently. They've been advancing it for some time. And while we stay in this state, he voted for Bush. I voted for Bush. I think he's a great man. Only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the former, Albert Einstein. But why is that? As we go through the day, particularly in the, in the last section, which is the most important, as I say, because it deals with the real foundation from which all of this comes, we'll see that people can give a wonderful, wonderful impression of being stupid because they are programmed to see the world in that way. And when they deprogram, bingo, the stupidity goes with it. The prison with the barbars. This is the whole basis of how the few control the many is to keep the many, A, in ignorance of what is going on and in ignorance of who they are and the nature of life itself so that they operate throughout their lives in a fraction of possibility in terms of their potential to perceive and potential to create. As Oscar Wilde said, most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions, their lives are mimicry, their passions a quotation. And that is summed up by a friend of mine who calls people repeaters. And this is the foundation of how the few control the many. They get them to repeat and parrot the official version of life. Doctors, they are repeaters. They are repeating what they were told to believe at medical school. Teachers, there are some very honorable exceptions, but a lot of them not least because of the pressure from the system, are repeaters. They go through school, they're very good at exams, so they, they qualify for teacher training college. There they get uh, told how to teach children and, and, and all the curriculum and stuff, and then they come into the classroom and they repeat it to the children who, if they accept it, become repeaters of the same information. Journalists. Well, I met one of them for a while, maybe one or two, but not too many. What I meet is reporters. And reporters is very close to repeaters, which is what they are. They are repeating the official version of events to the people to get them to believe it and then repeat it on so it becomes the accepted version of history. And when you don't repeat, when you refuse to repeat, when you want to speak your truth and see it your way, that's when you stand out. He's mad. He's dangerous. No, I'm not a repeater. And it's that mentality that creates the, the norms and the hive mind that allows the few to control the many. Putting in potentially infinite beings and turning out sausage machine people programmed through repetition, repetition, repetition of a version of life that suits those in control. And it's kind of interesting, if, if you're sitting around a table and uh, you said, right, now this is what we got to do, right? Somehow we got to take these children and we got to turn them out as adults so that they see the world the way we want them to see it. Now, how do we do that? Well, the best way, I don't think they'd have it like, but the best way is to take the children from their parents, about four, four, five, something like that, put them in school, bring them through. So we've got control of what they're being told kind of five days a week, um, right the way through their childhood, right into their teens, and then they'll turn out as adults in the way that we want them to be. That is what ideally they would want, and that is what they have achieved. We call it the education system. It is the indoctrination system. It doesn't have to be, it's the way it is. And that's what's brilliant about so many young people here today 
Because you've come through this system, you've gone through this indoctrination, and you're still bloody here, and that's fantastic. And more and people... And more people are waking up, because this is far more powerful than any indoctrination once we access it and stop allowing it to be suppressed. Then you've got uh, the media. The media. God. All they are is repeaters, repeating the same thing, repeating the same thing all the time. And the greatest form of mind control is repetition. Repetition. Keep telling them the same thing and it becomes their perceived reality. There we go. You you, you, you write what you're told. Thanks, nation builders. We couldn't control the people without you. If only we had journalists in the world on any kind of scale, the official stories would be demolished time and time again. Instead, they're repeated to the mass of the people who have no access to other information in the same way. What they want to stop through the education system, through the suppression of alternative views of reality, and through the way they control the mainstream media to uh, report the official version of events virtually unquestioned, is they want to stop the process of connecting the dots. Because once they're connected, the whole shebang is in big trouble because what's actually happening becomes an elephant in the living room. And then there's these people. I like this line at the bottom. Been bent over so long they think it's standing up. These. These are the politicians all over the world who go through as lobby, lobby foddy and voting foddy, who, or fodder, I don't know what the bloody word is, I don't know, fodder, that'll do. Foddy, oh, I've invented a word. Go through the lobby foddy. <laughs> and, and what they're doing, because they're looking at their career, oh, well, I better not vote against the government because, oh, my God, I might not be a minister. Well, actually, looking at you, mate, that would be a very good thing. Go and vote against the government, please. And they, the few, and how many people have gone, come out of the Blair cabinet and said, we don't even have cabinet government now. Never mind, you know, parliamentary government. It's diktat from, from, from a, a, a tiny clique, and that's it. And the lobby, lobby foddy, lobby foddy, my thing's gone. The lobby fodder goes through and votes these things into uh, law when if they stood up and opened their minds, these things wouldn't get through. So we have this great amalgamation of different people within what we call society and the uh, authorities who are pressuring to people to keep their mouth shut, keep their head down and just make sure that they just go with what's the norm and they don't uh, get involved in challenging what they're being told. And this uh, keep quiet, keep your head down and everything will be all right goes right the way through uh, society, it goes through journalism, it goes through the teaching profession, it goes through politicians. And they're all uh, looking at their interest rather than the interest of society as a whole. And the reason they want this is summed up by Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda minister. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension the truth becomes the greatest enemy of the state. And the reason we have, since 9-11, and since the London bombings, we have had this explosion of the Orwellian state is because of this. The truth is the enemy of the state, therefore we must suppress the truth in every way we can. And that's what it's all about in terms of the changes in society that we've been facing. They want to hold us symbolically in this tiny little eggshell where we only see the world the way that they want us to see it, so we'll stay in the box and be a piece of cake to manipulate. And so we are being attacked on endless different levels, which I'll come to, to keep us 
in that box and to keep the mind shut. You know, the worst thing you want if you want to run a dictatorship is an informed, sharp-thinking, open-minded population. So everything that is done is to suppress that situation so the people become the opposite. As Mencken said again, the most dangerous man to any government is the man who is able to think things out for himself. Almost inevitably, he comes to the conclusion that the government he lives under is dishonest, insane, and intolerable. And that's the truth that the suppression is designed to keep from us, but not from the people here today. We live in a world where there's two stories running side by side. One his job is to hide the other. There's the movie, as I call it. This is the version of events that we get through the mainstream media and the official authorities in general. This tells us that some guy in a cave in Afghanistan with a carrier pigeon or something orchestrated 9-11 and that 19 hijackers that couldn't fly a paper plane hijacked for jumbo jets. Yeah, it makes sense to me. This is the movie. Oh, it's them London bombers. Oh, yeah, well, they, they did it. Oh, we got to stop this now. Oh, we got to have this now. Oh, we've got to protect the people. The secret agenda is hiding behind that. The secret agenda, which is to create a global version of Nazi Germany and then some. This is the... <laughs> this is the official version. He's a man of God. He wants to protect the people because he's uh, from America. And we protect the world and all that stuff. That's what they want you to believe, that they're doing it on our behalf uh, because they're good and they want to help us. The secret agenda that that nonsense is hiding is the rapid emergence of the global Nazi state, of imposition, of constant surveillance, of microchipped people, and of centralization of power on a scale the world in known history has never seen. Have you noticed, I've noticed this, was walking around London yesterday. The world is controlled, at least on one level, by men in dark suits overwhelmingly, and in this country anyway, their will is imposed by people in luminous jackets. Are these luminous jackets, can they breed? Can they breed these jackets? Eh? I've seen them everywhere, you know, like rabbits, these jackets. Everyone wants one. Authority, I'm from security. And, yeah, and? What? Does that mean something? I know in America, excuse me, sir, that's the opening one. Excuse me, sir, I'm from security. Please for you, darling. <laughs> but of course, even the dark suits, as we'll get to, are merely pawns in a game, and pawns of a force that the public never see. And we are being pressured to go down the channel like laboratory mice and laboratory rats, go down the channel that's desired. So what they do, just as they do with these, these rats and mice in laboratory mazes, they'll shock them if they go down a certain road, they'll shock them if they go down this road, and they want them to go down this road. And eventually, when they've been shocked enough times, symbolic of society, you can't do this, these are the consequences of doing that, in the end, what the rats and mice do, without being shocked, turn the electricity off now, it's happened enough times, they'll go down the channel required without any pressure whatsoever, because they've reached that point of acquiescence to the system. And that's what they want to turn us into. That's why this camera's everywhere. Not just, not just to see where everyone is, although that's one level of it, but to constantly say, you can't go here, we're watching you, we're watching you, we're watching you. And in the end, you become like the mouse, doesn't want to be shocked anymore, and they acquiesce. Well, some of them, some people acquiesce. I'll go to my next dimension, not acquiescing, I'll tell you that. 
Now, Albert Pike, very, very major member of the Illuminati, the Illuminated Ones, illuminated into knowledge they keep from the rest of us, but not today. Um, he said this in a book called uh, Morals and Dogma is its short title. Fictions are necessary to the people, and the truth becomes deadly to those who are not strong enough to contemplate it in all its brilliance. In fact, what can there be in common between the vile multitude, that's how we're seen, and sublime wisdom? The truth must be kept secret, and the masses need a teaching proportioned to their imperfect reason. Now, if there's anyone here today, I doubt if there is, but if there's anyone here today, and certainly there are millions and millions out there who say, well, if all this was true, mate, we'd know about it. Well, when you see the way the system works, like hell we would. That's not the idea. Is the idea is to get us to see in these myopic, uh, tunnel vision ways that war is peace. Look at that, I love that one. Get a brain, morans. Well, I mean, it's got to be one of, the, one of the better lines, isn't it? Go, USA! And I love that! I love that! Go, USA! We have got to go into Iraq! We have got to go into Afghanistan! These buggers ain't going anywhere! It's like Bush! We will prevail! We will not concede! We are watching the friggin' sport, darling, on the White House telly! We send other buggers to do that. If Bush had been on the front line in Iraq when the first bullet was fired, he'd have been under a bed in Houston when the second bugger went off. And he's talking about, we, no, no, we'll send other people to do that. Voltaire, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And we have. Shock and frickin' awe. We've got to go in and bomb everyone. Because there's weapons of mass destruction. Make you believe absurdities. They can make you believe atrocities. We've got to go into Afghanistan. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. Because Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were responsible for 9-11. Believe absurdities. Commit atrocities. Away it goes. And that's why I wrote in my... Uh, my uh, website on the day that Bush was inaugurated for the first time. Don't be surprised if the United States finds itself in another manipulated war during this administration. You will see monsters created in the public mind to justify such action. It took months. And all justified by this day, which after the, uh, the first break, I'm going to get into in some uh, detail, among many other things, what's happening today. And in The Biggest Secret in 1998, I wrote, The plan is to engineer events, real and staged, that will create enormous fear in the countdown to 2012. Very important year to the Illuminati to get this whole Orwellian state in place. This includes a plan to start a third world war either by stimulating the Muslim world into a holy war against the West or by using China to cause global conflict, maybe both. Well, it is maybe both. It is maybe both because the China card is being prepared all the time. As all was said in 1984, that so prophetic book, which was not written from imagination. This man was heavily involved in politics, deeply involved in politics in this country. There's no way he was that accurate by accident. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a, a boot stamping on a human face forever. That is the perception they want of the world they want to create for everyone. That is the world that we are in the process of ensuring does not happen. So, I saw this lovely picture, this little monkey. So what's it all about, Mum? I mean, what's it all about? What is it all about? We're born, we're in this world we don't really understand, we don't know where we've come from, we don't know where we're going, we don't know where we are, therefore, because all the coordinates to give us that understanding are denied us. So what's it all about? In this first section, I'm going to 
go through some of the history of this up to the present day. Because by knowing where it's come from, it's, it's get a much better fix on where it is and where we are. The five sense conspiracy. What I mean by that is that which we perceive with the five senses. We, the world we look around and see with this tiny, tiny frequency range we call human sight that can access a infinitesimal fraction of what exists in the space that we're occupying. And I'm going to break it up into two parts, but I'm, uh, I'll tell you about that in a second. This is what the five sense conspiracy wants to create and is in the process of trying to do so. A world government which would dictate all major policy to every country, which would have a world central bank dictating global finance, a world currency which would be no physical money, just electronic uh, cash or electronic currency, a world army to impose the will of the world government on those countries that resist. I had a journalist ask me, no, sorry, sorry, I had a reporter, repeater ask me once, what would be the use of a world army? There'd be no one to fight. I thought, you're in the media, aren't you? How about the people that wish to live their lives in a different way to the centrally imposed dictatorship? Do you think they might have a role in that? I think they might. Microchip population, get all into this in detail this afternoon, and then super states. We've got the European Union, they want an American Union, the Pacific Union, they've already got the African Union, and that's the basic structure that they want in the five sense reality. Then there's the interdimensional level to this. In the start of the last section, I'll get into this part. The interdimensional level, because, you know, we perceive and are told to perceive that um, the only things that exist are within the tiny frequency range of, of, of human sight, which is so tiny. One writer said, quite rightly, uh, humans are basically blind in terms of what we can see compared with what there is to see and perceive. I'll get into that um, this afternoon. And then there's the, what they call the matrix, the interdimensional world. And then there's the third part, which is the most important part, as I keep emphasizing uh, the last part of the day, which is it's all an illusion. We think this is a solid stage. We think we're looking at a solid world, possible, impossible. And we think we're looking out here. You're out there. No. The only place this exists is in my head, and the only place I exist is in yours. That is the reality. And once you realize, once you realize that, then all the dots start to connect. Because when we realize how we create reality and how we create reality, the society that is the way it's structured today makes absolutely perfect sense. Oh, it's incompetent. They're all rubbish. They're all incompetent and useless. No. From that level they are. From this level, it's genius. The way that we've been manipulated. I mean, what, what the, these are, these are illusions. That appears to be three-dimensional. It's actually on the pavement. That's actually on the pavement. The brain being tricked by the way it's done to see it three-dimensionally. I get, I can say much more into all that later on. But what I want to start doing now is start at the beginning, number A, or letter A, and go through connecting the dots. And in this first section, I'm going to look at the occult conspiracy. And occult simply is a word meaning hidden. And my goodness me, it has been hidden. Hidden knowledge, hidden understanding. But if it's in the hands of the few and kept from the many, gives enormous power for the few to dictate and manipulate the many. And before I just start, I just want to say this. I'm not here to get anyone to believe anything. The last thing this world needs is another flipping bloke standing up saying, I've got all the answers, you must believe it, and that stuff. That's, we've had enough of them. We've had enough of them. This is information. Take of it what you will. Leave what doesn't feel right and whatever. And, and because what you think of this is none of my business. It is your business and your reality, and you have a right to make of it whatever you will. So I'm not trying to persuade anyone. I'm just trying to say...
I'm just trying to say, here's another way of looking at the world. The way you look at the world is completely your choice. Completely respected from here for a start. Now, a long, long time ago, well before what we call recorded history, the world was a global society. And it was an advanced global society. This is where these fantastic ancient structures came from. That, you know, the archaeologists and people say, oh, we couldn't build that today. How did they do it? Well, yeah, see, see that 400 ton stone, mate? You know what they did? They, they put some rope around it and got a few guys to pull it mile after mile. It's really brilliant, you know. I don't know how they did it. What about that hill? Oh, they're ever so strong. Yeah, all right. There was a global society. And for some reason, we can debate why it doesn't really matter from where we are. For some reason, this society became broken up. And it started to operate in isolation all over the world. But when it started out, all these different parts of the world, which now started working in isolation rather than as one whole, they still started off with that original advanced knowledge that was global at the time. And what's happened is this knowledge, as it's passed through the ages, I mean, some people talk about Atlantis, the name doesn't matter, it's this, this global society. As it passed through uh, history, it took its own way in these different uh, societies, isolated from each other uh, at that time. They gave different names to symbolize it. They used different methods of expressing it, but it was all the same knowledge. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Um, this is uh, one of the things that I'll, I'll be following through the, the, the day, um, uh, which is because it's relevant to introduce now. What happened with this knowledge is it was, it was passing through a society to start with, and then it started being hijacked by the few. More and more, this Illuminati network, as it emerged, um, who had this advanced knowledge and wanted to take it from the people so that they had power over the people, which is what it gives them, they started taking it out of circulation as best they could in society in general. One of the wonderful ways they did this was um, the Inquisition, where they used Christianity to go into all these um, ancient societies and Christianize them, and in doing so, they took the knowledge that was still available, they took it out of circulation, it had to go underground, and by taking it out of circulation and giving them a false version of reality, and then keeping that knowledge to themselves at the top level of these compartmentalized pyramids, they did a magnificent job in sucking this knowledge out of the, the people's um, society and just passing it on to the chosen few through the secret society network. And this pyramid, the compartmentalized pyramid, where the people at the top control all the pyramids below them, this is how the few control all areas of society. But I'll get into that big time this afternoon. Now, this is where I was going. This is a great friend of mine, uh, Credo Mutwa. He's um, a very famous uh, Zulu shaman in uh, South Africa. Wonderful, incredible, incredible man. Uh, library on legs. He was initiated into this knowledge some 50 year, 60 years ago. I mean, he's, uh, he's well into his 80s now. And in his, his words, when the European powers, and as we'll get to, the Illuminati-controlled European powers, came into Africa, they, quote, milked the minds of the shaman, found out what they knew, and then killed him. And what actually had to happen was the knowledge through African history, and it was the same in all these other ancient societies around the world, had to go underground into their own secret societies to pass it on so it survived. And when I was with him last, about nine months or so ago, he threw the bones for me, as they call it. These are carved animal bones. These go back centuries, he said. Um, and what, it, what they do, here's a closer look at them, what they do when they throw the bones is you put your hands over them, they're picking up your uh, frequency field, and then they throw them. And 
they look at where they've fallen in relation to each other and in relation to you, and then they, they give you a, a reading of what they mean and what they say. And when he did it for me, his accuracy was extraordinary. Things he had no idea about that were happening in my life. But when he did it, this is the point I'm making, I thought, he's just thrown the, the rune stones up in Germany, in that area of the world. Hey, he's just read the tarot cards from another area of the world. What I'm saying is this same knowledge, once universal, went off in different directions uh, and took different expressions, but it's the same knowledge. And this is the knowledge they have worked for centuries um, to take out of circulation. Um, so that around the world, we start to get a false version of who we are, a false version of reality, and a false version of what's happening um, on the planet. So this um, first global society broke up into different um, areas, but this Illuminati kept passing this knowledge through from the top level of that uh, pyramid, and this is the knowledge that the people in control of the world actually still have. And they use it and, um, on us, and they also put it in front of our eyes in terms of symbolism. This uh, is known as the Seal of Atlantis, apparently. Um, uh, versions of it have been found um, around the world. The seal, the circle. This is what they built for Bush when he was accepting the presidential nomination from the Republican Party. Because the uh, top level of these organizations of power work with this uh, knowledge all the time. And when we get to the last section, we'll see that it's not just symbolism for symbolism's sake, it's actually having an effect um, on us and the way we see the world. There's Bush, nice man, never goes home. Um, and this is the, the Republican uh, celebration that Bush was again going to be there uh, presidential candidate. So, here's Bush, one of these bloodlines, interbreeding is not a great thing it seems, um, uh, one of these bloodlines that has gone through from the ancient world, as I'm going to come to in a second, because presidents are not uh, created by or selected by ballot, they are selected by bloodline. There is another um, and there is another version of Bush's uh, history, though, and I think, I think there's a lot of, <laughs> I think there's a lot of truth in it. I have great sympathy with this one, but somehow it becomes president of the United States. Something, something's wrong with the world. Now, when you um, when you start researching this, one area of the world, like I say, it happens all over the place, but one area of the world that really you start to pick off is this work, this area here. Um, what we now call Iraq and that area of the world, what a coincidence, what was once known as Sumer and Babylon. Babylon comes up again and again in Illuminati research. And what you find is a series of, of uh, bloodline networks uh, that were behind the Babylonian Empire when that was a massive, massive center of power. And they moved up into um, Italy, particularly to Rome, where they became the Roman Church and the Roman Empire. And then they moved up into Northern Europe, where they became the aristocracy and royal families, in truth, royal family of Europe. And then, through the empires, started to go global, the British Empire, etc. Now, in Babylon, I'm going to get into this in some detail soon, in Babylon, this advanced knowledge was held and was fundamental to uh, the control of that society and the way it was run. And from this center, we have now reached a point of global Babylon, where the same uh, situation is emerging globally as happened there. Of course, the Babylonian Empire, like I was saying, was um, centered on the area that we now call Iraq. Now, yes, oil was involved. Yes, many things were involved. One of the things that I'm, uh, I've seen so often over the years and years of researching this is that there is very rarely, if ever, just one reason why something is done. And one of the reasons for the focus on Iraq 
is that historically it is like a sacred area to this Illuminati because this in many ways is where it started out and expanded itself towards its goal of global control. So like I say, they moved out up into Europe and they became the royal families and aristocracy of Europe. And there came a point where the people were now beginning to rebel against in-your-face dictatorship, the rule by monarch. And so these bloodlines started moving out of overt control, in-your-face dictatorship through the monarchs, into the, the, the dark suit areas of control as they've become. Control of banking, control of politics, control of business, control of all these areas that dictate our lives uh, today. And through the British Empire, particularly the British, on which it was said the sun never set, quite rightly, but also the French and others, but particularly the British, it went out all over the world. And then there came a point where apparently on the surface, these former colonies were given independence. That was only, however, on the surface, because the center of the Illuminati is in Europe. Historically, that's where it has been, Europe, the Vatican, the uh, uh, city of London, etc. And what happened when colonialism came to an end is that there was a sleight of hand. There's two forms of dictatorship. There's one you can see, touch and taste, communism, fascism, apartheid. At least the people in that situation know that they're under control and they can see who's controlling them, at least on one level. Eventually, the human desire for freedom is going to rebel about, uh, against that because they know what they're dealing with. The greatest form of control is the control you can't see. The prison without the bars. Because you'll sit there in prison under control thinking you are free for your whole life. Because you don't think there's anything you need to do about it. And what happened when this colonial situation ended is the bloodlines were left out in those countries. So was the secret society network through which the bloodlines manipulate themselves and their place men and women into power. And they've gone on being controlled from Europe ever since. Not by Blair's government or the German government. No, no. Pawns in the game. The center of the secret society network, which is based in Europe. And one of the great centers is London, or Babby London, as it's become known. Um, the city of London, all around the area of St. Paul's where all the finance and stuff goes on. And also the area that's become uh, more famous recently with Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, and, and, and uh, stories about that, which is this area of London known as the Temple, which um, is where the legal profession is centered. Now when I say the legal profession, I'm talking about a pyramid again. Not everyone who's a lawyer in this area is involved in any manipulation. We're talking about the core, that control from within, that the vast majority of lawyers have no idea even exists. And of course, this is a very symbolic church, a, a, a Knights Templar church, I think going back to the late 12, 1200s, 12th century, that kind of period, um, which was built by the Knights Templar who used to run that whole area. And when you do the research, they still do. Also, the Vatican became a great center during the Roman um, Empire, of course, it, because the, uh, and, and what followed. And of course, it was the Roman Church that became Christianity that was set up out of Rome, and it was set up by the same bloodlines that moved from Babylon to Rome. The Church of Rome is the Church of Babylon, and that's a big key symbolic of the way the building is even structured there. So these bloodlines, I'll get into as we go through the day why these people are obsessed with genetics. There are two levels to it, and the, 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 the real level I'll get to towards the end of the day. But there's a real reason why they're obsessed with genetics and holding a certain DNA, which is really, really important to them. Um, this is just a, a, a few. You can follow them. It takes a hell of a lot of research, and a lot of genealogists have done a lot of research, and there's a hell of a lot still more to do. But you can pick up bloodlines that come down through ancient Egypt, uh, down through Sumer, 
uh, the Indus Valley civilization, very, very advanced through the Phoenicians, Babylon, down through Philip of Macedonia, who was the father of Alexander the Great, who by the time he died in Babylon at the age of, what, 32, 33, had plundered and controlled much of that blue and white map that we're looking at. The bloodlines came down through Cleopatra and the Roman Empire, down through Constantine the Great, the Roman Emperor, who at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD created the Nicene Creed, which is the foundation belief of Christianity to this day. Came down through the Merovingians. Now, of course, the Merovingians have, have been brought to uh, public attention by Holy Blood and Holy Grail, and then by, uh, in effect, its offshoot, um, the Dan Brown book, uh, The Da Vinci Code. The Merovingians are... Uh, very, very important to the Illuminati. They are a prime bloodline that, that, that takes the name Merovingians, and the, the names have changed through the centuries, but Merovingian bloodline is one of the major ones. And like I say, it was uh, featured in both of these books. Incidentally, um, just my view, the Merovingian bloodline is very, very important to the Illuminati, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the bloodline of Jesus. That's the kind of little diversion off, you know, where we lose the plot. Well, we lose the plot. And interestingly, in the Matrix movie, one of the key characters who was the gatekeeper was given the name uh, the Merovingian, which uh, the writers of that uh, could not have done by accident, given the background. So he comes down through the Merovingians, through Charlemagne, or the, the uh, emperor, the Holy Roman emperor, uh, Empire for um, a, a long time, through the Habsburgs out of Austria, through the de Medici family, a major, major banking family in Italy, and down through the House of Lorraine, which is still a major Illuminati bloodline operating as its base in that area around the French-German border. Of course, the House of Lorraine symbol is the double cross. Oh, he double-crossed me. Yeah, very appropriate, especially in Exxon, who just... Um, who just announced record profits while we're paying record amounts for fuel. Comes down through the French royal dynasties and into, uh, into Britain down to the present royal family. It comes into um, America, down through the presidents of America. I mean, if you look at the genealogy of American presidents, it, it reads to a large extent like a, a royal bloodline in Europe, which is where many of them uh, came from. So right down to, to, to the Bush family. And what, it, what is that but, but a dynasty? When you have your father um, having two, three terms as president of the United States, two officially given to Reagan, but that's just, a, just for public consumption. And then his son comes along who has to have help uh, tying his shoelaces and becomes president of the United States. I mean, there's something, there's something we need to know here. Coming down to this man uh, from a very, very long way back. This is, a, this is an alternative genealogy. Like I say, I have great sympathy with it. <laughs> I like this one. I like this one. I like that one. That's my favorite. Yeah. Who am I? You're an idiot. Thank you. <laughs> Comes down through the Scottish bloodlines. Now, Scotland is really, really uh, uh, kind of important area for, Illumina for the Illuminati. Um, and it's no accident that the biggest secret society in the world, in terms of numbers, is called the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Comes down through um, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and, and the banking and, and business families of the world. Joseph Smith, who started the Mormon Church, Merovingian bloodline. Uh, down through Brigham Young, who took it on from him, Merovingian bloodline. Uh, one of the symbols going right back through history of the Merovingians is the uh, bee or the beehive. They found Merovingian graves where there's, there's uh, symbolic bees and, and, and beehives in there um, in, the, uh, in the kind of uh, architecture and stuff because it was, that was the symbol. This is the, the uh, seal of Utah, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Mormon church, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Illuminati, and no accident that the center of it is the beehive, the symbol of the Merovingian bloodline. Uh, Charles Taze Russell, who one of the people who got the Watchtower Society uh, going. Jehovah's Witnesses, Merovingian bloodline, um, buried in, uh, under a pyramid somewhere uh, in America. 
And it's, it's not just me that's done this, it's a lot of research going into this obsession with genetics that the uh, Illuminati bloodlines have. And because they go under different names, you know, if, if, if every president of the United States is called Rockefeller, people go, oh, honey, everyone's called Rockefeller, what's going on? But they don't decide that. They've got different names. It's the genetics that matter, not the name. It's the DNA, for reasons I'll come to as the day unfolds. Now, as these bloodlines went through history, they uh, brought about their Illuminati empires of various kinds. Uh, they want a global empire now. Like I say, uh, they moved up from, from this area of the world, Babylon, up into Europe. And one thing that they did was that they took with them their church, the Church of Babylon. Um, and I'll, I'll come to this um, shortly. But when you look at the beliefs of Christianity and its symbolism, and the beliefs uh, and symbolism of the Church of Babylon, they are the same. They just relocated. Better view, apparently. Um, and then they went uh, global with their uh, empires more and more. And the idea is to have a global empire so that they uh, dictate to everyone from a central point through the prison without the bars, trying as much as possible to persuade people they're free so they won't rebel against the fact that they're not. And the way it works, you can symbolize it as a pyramid or you can symbolize it as a spider's web. The spider is in the center. You don't see the spider. It doesn't put itself on public display. And the web is made up of secret societies which at the top level, not the lower ones, who are just, again, fodder. God, fodder, I got it out this time. Fodder. Um, at the top level, they interconnect. Um, and, for instance, people talk about something called the Bilderberg Group, which is starting to get um, a lot of publicity because it's a, a center of manipulation. The Bilderberg Group's nowhere near the spider. The real secretive groups, the ones with the real power that really operate in the shadows, they're the ones you find around the spider. And then eventually you start coming out until you meet organizations that people have heard of and interact with daily society. This is how it works. And down the spider, down the spider's web, comes the, the agenda and it's introduced by people well away from the spider who do, probably don't even know the spider exists either. So if you can see someone, like a Bush or a Blair, you can see them in daily life, they're nowhere near the center or the top of the Illuminati. And like I say, you can symbolize it like this. All the way through, they have been uh, imposing this structure on society as they've got more and more power as they've passed through history. Uh, the few at the top, they have the real picture, the real knowledge, and everyone else is compartmentalized, only knowing as much as it takes to do their job. And these uh, uh, different organizations in society, at the level that we experience them, appear to be completely unconnected. But because it's like pyramids within pyramids, like Russian dolls, one doll inside a bigger doll inside a bigger doll, eventually they are encompassed by the global pyramid. And from that point, the same agenda is dictated through all these apparently here unconnected organizations. And this is how you find the same things being introduced in countries all over the world, sometimes even with the same wording. This is how we've had this situation where we've had the incessant centralization of power in all areas of our lives, media ownership, banking ownership, corporations, um, uh, governments with the European Union becoming a, a dictator to all the countries below it. Centralization of power for a simple reason. If, if you are the few and you want to control the many, you have to centralize decision making. The more diversity of decision making there is, the less control you're going to have over it. It's like having loads of plates spinning on sticks on a stage. If you've got too many, eventually they're going to start crashing. You want one big, big plate, one big stick, and you can control that from a central point, no problem. That's why. They, we have seen this incessant centralization of power in the world because every time it's happened, fewer have control over even more. This is the structure that, that, that they're moving towards. They want a situation, and they already have it up to a large level, they want a global completion of it, where this hidden hand 
is controlling in our experience apparently not only unconnected people and organizations, but people and organizations who are in our perspective at war with each other or um, in conflict with each other. Because this is the movie. This is the movie that we see. Oh, have you seen the news? They just invaded so and so now. Oh yeah, that's the, the movie. And, and if we can just lift our minds to see that just because the leaders of their, that side and the leaders of that side seem to be in conflict, it doesn't necessarily mean they're not actually on the same side. Because they're not fighting the wars they create, they're fighting the wars that they create. And the reason why they do that and engineer wars will become clear this afternoon. But this is the hidden hand that you never see that controls the Blairs and the Bushes. The Illuminati, the all-seeing eye as it calls itself. Now, <clears throat> the Illuminati Secret Society Network. This has come out of Babylon. It goes back further, but Babadan's a really good point where you can pick it up. And it's traveled through um, history, getting bigger and bigger, carrying the knowledge of that global society uh, which was far more advanced than ever we perceive uh, it could have been, carrying this structure of control through history, the same as the structure of control in the Freemasons, the different levels of degree where the people in the higher degrees know what the lower degrees don't know. Um, and it, as I say, it goes back a vast amount of time. This is a book, um, The Children of Mu, or also known as Lemuria. It's, it's a, an alleged ancient um, land which went down in cataclysms, much like the story of Atlantis. And this guy, guy James Churchwood, traveled in the uh, last century um, to many, many places trying to uncover evidence of the existence of this great uh, continent called Mu, or Lemuria as it later became known. And he said that in, in um, isolated monasteries and such like in Asia, he was shown tablets and uh, accounts that were supposed to go back tens of thousands of years. And these are some of the symbols that were in, um, in those accounts and uh, on those tablets. Uh, this, of course, is the swastika. Um, the Germans didn't, uh, or the Nazis, didn't just... Um, the swastika because it was, you know, a nice symbol. It's because it symbolized something. And they wanted to use it because they had access to this advanced knowledge of how you can manipulate the mind and what have you um, without people realizing it. And, and the, the, the symbolism speaks to us. We may not realize it does, but it does, and they know it does. Um, the, here's the Maltese cross, which is the symbol to this day of a secret society called the Knights of Malta that were once known as the Knights Hospitaller of St. John of Jerusalem. They go back like a thousand years. And they have among their number today some of the you know, most famous and apparently powerful people in the world. Reagan, for instance, was a Knight, knight of Malta. Um, and there's this symbol as well here, which will, on the left here, which will left to me, or left to you, actually, I'm turning around, aren't I? Um, which we'll come to um, shortly. But these symbols uh, have passed through history and you find them in the secret societies today. The Maltese cross, like I say, of the Knights of Malta is um, still their symbol to this day. Now to give you a, a, an idea of how these secret societies passed through history and uh, manipulated events, uh, we can pick up uh, around the time of the Crusades when a number of knights organizations were created, which, like I say, are still going today and have among their number these top people in uh, global politics, business, banking, media, etc. One of them was the uh, Knights Templar, who still today are vastly, vastly influential in the city of London and further afield, but the city of London and so-called the area of the temple and that church uh, and the legal profession. I um, had a friend uh, years ago who was married to a very, very high uh, uh, barrister, uh, legal type in uh, the city of London, the Temple area. And uh, they were getting on great until she found out he was involved with the Knights Templar at a, at a serious level. And, and from that moment on, he tried to destroy her life and destroy her out of nothing, just because she discovered that he was involved in this organization. Very, very uh, simple thing. If you're going to control the people on this five cents level, you need to control their access to money. 
You need to control the fact that they have to borrow money that doesn't exist from you and then pay you interest on it. Yeah? <laughs> people, people go to a bank, they think they're, they think they're borrowing money. I'm borrowing, can I, can I borrow 50,000 pounds? Is that all you want? 50,000 pounds of that, all right? I want to say, shh, 50,000 pounds on the screen. You going to move any money anywhere? Any precious special? No, no, it's done. Uh, you now pay us interest on this 50,000 pounds until you pay it back. And if you don't pay it back, then we come and get your house that does exist because you haven't paid us back this. Okay, great. That's the great. I love it. So, you have to control, you have to control, you have to control people's access to money. But also, you have to control the law. Uh, which you then can impose and tie the people up in. So th that's one of the major reasons they really want to control the law. And this, the law is very different to the way we're, we're told it is. Anyway, another organization, Knights Organization, which started out around the same time was the Knights Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem that became the Knights of Malta, and also a, a German-centered uh, network called the Teutonic Knights. And um, they um, settled in Jerusalem uh, around the time of the Crusades. The, Knights Templar, which I'm going to follow through for a little, uh, couple of three minutes, um, they, uh, as their cover story, said that they were set up to protect pilgrims going to Jerusalem. And uh, they had nine knights, so my God, they were protecting a lot of pilgrims. It was a cover story. They went and parked themselves in Jerusalem, and they discovered something. And suddenly, I think it was two of them, came back to France, where they were based, and suddenly they started to expand massively the Knights Templar. They were signing up the um, aristocratic and wealthy families of Europe and you had to give them you know, wealth and land to join them and all that stuff. They found something of great significance. And suddenly the Knights Templar were um, a major, major organization. There's a Knights uh, Templar on the left, the red cross on the white background, and that's a hospitaller with the Maltese cross, Knights of Malta today. Um, on the right. Of course, the, the, the red cross and the white background became the flag of England. Very appropriate. Knights Templar England. The George's Cross. St. George's Cross. St. George comes from George of Cappadocia in what we now call um, Turkey, the land at the time uh, of the Phoenicians who came to Britain and brought this uh, knowledge and these symbolisms with them. So, there came a time where 1307 when the Templars had built a massive network in Europe, which became the basis of the modern banking system. They were charging interest on money that didn't exist, and all the stuff that goes on today just uh, expanded. And Philip the Fair, the King of France, for various reasons, he wanted to get rid of the Templars. So he announced that they were going to be uh, removed, I think it was Friday the 13th, that's why it's been considered unlucky ever since, uh, 1307. But some of the Templars, um, knew this was happening and they got away. Their grand master at the time was a guy called Jacques de Molay. Uh, and still today you have the Molay societies and stuff in America and various other places which these top politicians are members of. No accident. And the Templars that knew about it got away and they got away definitely uh, recorded two uh, ways. I would say three because of other fines. The third was to America. Because they uh, knew of America's existence long before Christopher Lum Columbus got in his boat. Um, and they went in two other directions. One was down to Portugal, where they hid behind an organization called the Knights of Christ. And one of their uh, grand masters was a guy called Prince Henry the Navigator. And this became uh, very significant because... They had access, and still, uh, all the way through this history, um, to knowledge that the public didn't get. And at this point, one of the, the expressions of that knowledge was maps of the world. This is why they found a map of what the land looks like under Antarctica, which was written uh, not long after, just a, a few years basically, after Columbus. In the 1500s it was, it was drawn. And he said, uh, the guy, I think it's Piri Reis, I think his name was, from the Ottoman um, Navy, Navy, and he said that he'd drawn the map from previous maps, uh, earlier maps. Well, during the 60s, when uh, in America they did uh, a look at this map based on uh, sonic uh, kind of surveys as they do in Antarctica, they found that this map, drawn in the 1500s from maps earlier, 
was incredibly accurate in terms of what the landmass was like under Antarctica, which was like miles under ice. Um, so this knowledge was known. And one of the uh, sea captains close to Prince Henry, the navigator, in the Knights of Christ, the Knights Templar in other words, was the father-in-law of Christopher Columbus. I mean, Christopher Columbus was looking for India and tripped over. What's this? What's this? You're having a laugh. I mean, they, he knew basically where he was going. It was a cover story. Another place they went was round the west coast of Scotland and into uh, west coast of Ireland into Scotland, um, where these Templars that went that way settled in Scotland and around Rosslyn Chapel, Rosslyn Castle. And this, of course, now has become uh, more and more famous by the Holy Grail and Dan Brown books. The Knights Templar um, hid under, under there, underground there, and they re-emerged in part as the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, uh, the biggest secret society in terms of membership in the world, apparently. And in Rosslyn Chapel, which is not far from Edinburgh, they have in their stonework uh, cactus plants and aloe plants and other depictions that at the time it was built were only, uh, only existed in America, which has not been officially discovered. But a very rare book, excellent book, which I found written by a Canadian um, in, who lives in the, the east coast of uh, Canada, he, um, his research showed that Prince Henry St. Clair, the St. Clair family, that was the uh, family at uh, Rosslyn Chapel, comes from the St. Clair family in France, who were uh, prime uh, creators of the Knights Templar originally, so that's why the Templars went there, that he landed in Newfoundland and that east coast of uh, what, what we call New England in 1398, best part of a hundred years before Columbus discovered America. They knew it was there. Um, and it was just part of the, the plan. So, with that knowledge, they then move in, these Illuminati families, through the photo opportunities of Columbus, etc., into America. And just four or five years after he landed down here somewhere, Columbus, John Cabot um, discovered North America. What a coincidence! Uh, especially when, according to a famous Freemasonic historian called Manly P. Hall in America, Cabot, whose real name was Giovanni Cabotto, operated in the same secret society network in Genoa as Christopher Columbus. They were finding what they knew was there because the time had been reached to move this globalization agenda out of Europe um, into America to take over that continent, which was going to be the focal point for the next stage, which is what we're experiencing now. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon wrote a book called The New Atlantis, and he was an initiate of this secret society network. Brilliant man. And uh, The New Atlantis has been uh, widely interpreted as being a, uh, a foretelling of the society of America. Benjamin Franklin and a lot of these so-called founding fathers and others, they came into America with the knowledge as agents of this Illuminati to take that continent over. Uh, again, he was one of the major players in the introduction to America of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. And a few years ago, um, there was a newspaper article about uh, the renovation of Franklin's home uh, near Trafalgar Square. And when they dug up the floor, it was, I think they were going to create a museum for him, uh, they found ten bodies, six of them children, which they dated to the time that uh, Franklin and his uh, housemate were there. And they said he must have been into uh, body snatching for medical research. But when you get into, as we will before this first break, when you get into what they're into, there could be, oh, be another explanation for ten bodies under the floor. George Washington, another aristocratic bloodline, who became the first president of the United States. The takeover was already underway from the start. He was a major, major Freemason. Do Freemasons do a lot of washing up? Is that... <laughs> I don't know. Is that what they do? I don't know. They take themselves seriously. They look tosses to me. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. 
Anyway, he was a major, major Freemason and the, an aristocratic bloodline. He became the first president of the United States. Stands back in amazement, can't believe it. Um, this is how it works. This is his apron, and uh, the son there will... will uh, oh, you've got one like that, have you? And the sun will become clear soon. He was also apparently a knight of the garter. There's the, uh, there's the Templar sign in the middle. Apparently, that's what I've read in various places. Um, which, of course, is a major grouping of people uh, around the British monarch. And he's supposed to be fighting the British monarch to give independence to America. Maybe I came in late and missed something. I don't know. And this is the, one of the holy grails in America of uh, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. It's a... Uh, a, a larger temple, a series of temples actually, in Boston, where in New England they introduced the secret societies that were going to take America over. And funnily enough, I was speaking in Boston a few years ago, and we went in there, and uh, there was a guy on the door, and we asked him if he did tours. He said, no, we don't do tours. He said, but, but go and see the office. Uh, go in the office and ask, ask them any questions you've got. He says, the doorman, like. So we walk up and walk in. And we walk up the stairs, can't see a bloody soul in this bloody Freemasonic bloody temple, this holy grail in America. So I went up another couple of stairs and onto another level, still no bugger there, walked along the corridors, all these bloody things and painted stuff, walked round, had a camera with us, good thing, and suddenly we walk into this bloody temple. It's not, it was like the Mary Celeste. So here we go, this is the first time I've been on in a chair. I just, I just, I just needed to, t I know, when I was a goalkeeper they called me Cinderella because I kept missing the ball, I wasn't very good, I wasn't very good. I had this terrible match once, I was terrible, I sat down in the dressing rooms, I put my head in my hands and I freaking dropped that as well, you know. So. Went out, threw myself in front of a bus, went under me, you know, kind of thing. Olden's are the best. Anyway, the reason I tell you this story is that some of the, uh, the pictures within this lodge um, were uh, of people that are relevant to what we're talking about today. This is a picture taken inside, and it's of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of the great front men for the Illuminati in the 20th century, honorary Grand Master, Order de Molay, Jacques de Molay, leader of the Templars at the time of the Purge in 1307. The more this day unfolds, the more the dots will connect one after the other. These people are members of the same secret societies. That's how they get manipulated into power. So, Global Babylon. This secret society, bloodline connection, went through um, history, expanding and expanding and expanding its power to the point we have today. As we said, out of there, through into Europe globally. And what they've taken with them and created on the way are apparently unconnected areas of society, but all of them designed for control. When you go back to Babylon, I'll get to this uh, now, when you go back to Babylon and the, the religion of Babylon, you find that what we call Christianity is the religion of Babylon relocated to Rome, as I mentioned earlier. Judaism, um, the, what, the basis of Judaism was uh, emerged and written after the captivity in Babylon. A lot of Islam accepts the Judaistic Christian story up to a point, at Jesus and stuff. Um, banking, lending people money that doesn't exist and charging interest on it. They did that in Babylon. Uh, the government, centralization of power, uh, top-down dictatorships of power, Babylon. Uh, secret societies, all these different uh, secret societies with their black and white floors and their secret handshakes come from Babylon and other parts of the world. And so do what we call today satanic ritual. I mean, people have no problem with the fact that back then people used to get sacrificed and all this stuff in these grotesque rituals. And children used to get sacrificed, and young virgins used to get sacrificed. Oh yeah, I've read about it, mate. Terrible, wasn't it? I, I've just got to try to get across to people that it never stopped in terms of these bloodlines, and they still do it today. Now, 
If you can, in a ritual, sacrifice a terrified child, are you going to have any empathy with 3,000 people dying in uh, 9-11, on 9-11, just to advance your agenda? You have no empathy. Therefore, you have no emotional consequences of your actions. Therefore, anything goes. That's what we're dealing with. All these areas of society, if you go up uh, the, the pyramid to the people, they are the, uh, the successors of Babylon. Secret language of illumination. Like I say, these, these uh, bloodlines and the secret societies, they have a language of uh, symbolism which has passed through the centuries and the thousands of years with them and they still use it today. Um, the various symbols of Freemasonry and all the other secret societies go back to Babylon. And by the way, that is where the necktie comes from. From the secret society rituals. I mean, <clears throat> oh, yo, you're not properly dressed our day. You've got to have a tie on. Okay, I'll put a noose around my neck. Yeah, that's fine. There you go. That's where it came from. And people um, all over the world, um, where again, you know, in, in, in countries, developing countries, where they had their own national dress, their own style of, 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 of everything, they've been indoctrinated into, this is the Western style, it's the great style, it's the style, therefore put a noose around your neck and you'll feel better. It's where it came from. Now, the, things like the, uh, the, the, the Freemasonic floor and the Freemasonic temple, black and white squares. You look at the cathedrals all over the place and you find they have black and white squared floors. And one of the reasons for this is that they were built um, to the design and with the money of, largely, of the Knights Templar, um, who were behind the great cathedral building uh, period. And they were built under esoteric law. This is why you find all these uh, mathematical codes within uh, the major cathedrals and stuff. And the police, what an accident. I mean, they, there's many ways of designing a hat, but it just happens to be black and white squares. And, and you find this all over the world with the American police and other police around the world. I mean, crikey, what, what is it? You know, am I suggesting that police might be connected to secret societies? I, I wash my mouth out. I would never do it. I'd never do it. I've not worked out where the luminous frickin' jacket comes in. Oh, illuminated. Got it. Yeah, that's right. Illuminated. Now, this religion, which, which, which explains so much about society today in terms of its symbols and, and also organizations of religion and stuff that, that exist, is to understand the Babylonian trinity. They had a trinity of three points of a almighty God, a father God, Nimrod, a female called Queen Semiramis, also known as Ishtar or Istar, apparently it's, it was pronounced, and the, uh, the son, the virgin-born son of Babylon, thousands of years before Christianity, was Tamos. It goes under other names too. Well, I'll take Tamos uh, as, as the name uh, to keep it simple. So, Nimrod, Queen Semiramis, and Tamos are around us all the time uh, today. This was uh, Nimrod, or one of the symbolisms of uh, Nimrod. He was the father god um, who uh, married Semiramis and, and in all the Babylonian stories. And he, when he died, was said to have gone to the sun, to become part of the sun and the sun god Baal. He was uh, symbolized in a number of ways. Uh, the sun was, was a big symbol of Nimrod. And you find sun symbolism all the way through. This is uh, the uh, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian society. This is uh, Sri Lanka, again, the sun. This is uh, Rome, the sun. And the, uh, the, the lion with the mane became symbolic of the sun. The royal animal, the king of the jungle, the king of the solar system with the, the mane symbolizing the rays of the sun. And, of course, all over British royalty, you find the, the lion. Uh, again, it symbolizes the sun and other things to these people, although it doesn't to us. Um, on the side of that Boston Freemasonic uh, temple, lodge that I was uh, talking about, again, the sun, illumination, illuminated, the sun being that symbol, uh, among other things. Now, one of the other ways that they symbolized uh, Nimrod 
was as a god they called Dagon, uh, among other names, the fish god. And what you're looking at is how the Babylonians symbolize Nimrod in his form of the fish god. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. And of course, the church of Babylon relocated to Rome and took with it the symbolism of Babylon. This is why you find the holy days of Christianity under different names are the same holy days as Babylon. Only the names have changed. Um, look, he's turned his toes up and he had one of them hats on as well. Look, the fish got He looks like a bloody fish, that, that guy. So we have Nimrod Aircraft. Um, no accident, they picked these names by, by choice. Nimrod was also the same symbolism as Osiris, who was symbolized in the same way in um, ancient Egypt. So you had uh, the story of uh, Osiris being killed by the dark force, um, and then uh, his uh, virgin uh, uh, wife, Isis, found all the parts of Osiris except his willy, right? Now you go to Babylon and you have exactly the same story told of Queen Semiramis and Nimrod because it was the same symbolism coming from the same source and it's passed through history um, uh, in, in the way that we're talking about. So then we come to Queen Semiramis. Now this is a very interesting part of, part of the, the symbolism uh, all over uh, our society, particularly in America. Queen Semiramis um, was said to have come from the moon in an egg, and that is very much part of um, what we call Easter, which I'll get to. But uh, Queen Semiramis, this is uh, the rebuilt uh, Ishtar, Ishtar Gate in Babylon. Queen Semiramis was the mirror of Isis, and in many ways the mirror of what became known as Mother Mary in terms of what was said about her. This is an original Babylonian piece of artwork, which the British Museum were trying to buy, I don't know if they ever did. And this is the, the goddess, Semiramis Ishtar, and beside her, very much part of her symbolism, are the owls. And before we get to the first break, the significance of that in today's society will become very clear. They said of Queen Semiramis in Babylon that she was the virgin mother who was impregnated by the rays of the sun, which was the um, the, uh, the spirit of Nimrod, after he died, impregnating her, so she had a virgin impregnation and gave birth to the son Tammuz, the mirror of the Jesus story that followed much later. The Queen of Heaven, they called her. That's what they called Mother Mary and still do when the Church of Babylon relocated to Rome. This is how the Babylonians symbolized Ishtar, Ishtar, Queen Semiramis, and Tammuz. I think I've seen that somewhere before. That's Mother Mary and Jesus in a, in a church today. That's Isis and Horus in Egypt. That's in a church on the Isle of Wight, Mother Mary. Uh, you're looking at the same uh, recurring story from the same source. And what they've done is that they have all these religions, they have the inner core that know it's symbolic, not literal, and then you have the outer religion where they tell the people to take the symbolic, the esoterically symbolic, literally, and they create prison religions to shut down the mind to stop further advancement and opening. <laughs> And this is the, the Black Madonna. This is just a little point to make as we go along. What the Illuminati do is they, they, they get involved, like Satanists, they're the same bloody thing uh, in many ways, they, they reverse symbol, uh, symbolize everything. So if something is, is white to us, to them they symbolize it as black. If something's black to us, they'll symbolize it as white. The um, classic uh, satanic um, symbol is the pentagon, uh, or the pentagram rather, and what they do is reverse it to point down, um, symbolizing the negative. They reverse the symbolism, and that's what we'll, we'll see as we go along here now. Now, this is the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in London. Uh, this is the point uh, and the, the place from which Freemasonry was launched into the new Americas, into the colonies, through people like Benjamin Franklin. 
And what a staggering coincidence that they located this in Great Queen Street in London. What did they call uh, Semiramis in Babylon? The Great Queen. Great Queen Street. So, when they give us a cover story that the state of Virginia was named after the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I, well, first of all, Elizabeth I was no more a virgin than Madonna, so that's out of it. And secondly, Virginia, the Virgin Queen, Semiramis Ishtar from Babylon. This is how they symbolized Semiramis in Babylon. This is on an ancient coin. I think I've seen that somewhere before. Where could it be? The Statue of Liberty, reverse symbolism, the Statue of Symbolic Control, was given to New York by French Freemasons in Paris who knew what it symbolized. Semiramis and more, as I'll come to now. So, there we go. I think I've seen somewhere before. And that is the goddess of the French Republic. Because as the bloodlines came up out of Babylon, up through into Europe and what became France, they took the symbolism with them. Of course they did. And so the goddess of the French Republic was given uh, the same Semiramis symbolism as the, uh, the so-called goddess of America, Statue of Liberty. Uh, the goddess of the state of Colombia, the center of political control in America, Again, Semiramis symbolism. Columbia, where did that come from? Well, where did Columbus come from? Because it wasn't his real name. Back in Babylon, they symbolized Queen Semiramis as a dove. And <clears throat> when um, they moved to Rome, they worshipped her under the name Venus Columba, Venus the Dove. Apparently in French today, the word Columba, or worse to that effect, I'm crap at foreign languages, means dove. So Christopher Columbus was the branch bearer of the dove across to the new world and the new uh, frontier for the Illuminati. So we have the District of Columbia, the center of government. We have... Um, British Columbia on the uh, west of Canada. We have Columbia pictures with that symbolism of the lady with the lighted torch. The lighted torch will become clear in a second. Well, it's clear enough, it's lighted, but you know what I mean. Columbia University, where um, a lot of people come through uh, indoctrinated into the, uh, into the scam. CBS, Columbia Broadcasting, and that eye will become very uh, significant very shortly. This is from the note paper of uh, the uh, Supreme Council of uh, Freemasonry in Britain. The Dove, Columbia, um, Semiramis, Babylon. On these septics or whatever, the queen olds in her ceremonies and stuff. Um, you, you find the Knights of Malta and the Dove, <laughs> Semiramis. I mean, do you, know, do you know there's still people today, I, I, I don't believe it, I can't, people are that daft, that they still back out of the room so the Queen never sees their backs, they have to back out, you know, you might, I mean, what? I, I'm sure I saw the paper this morning and it was 2006, I'm sure it was. What's going on? Oh, mom. Anyway. When Nimrod died, it was decreed in Babylon that he would be symbolized from then on as a flame or a lighted torch. The same when Tammuz, the sun, died. And incidentally, um, they said that Tammuz was the reincarnation of Nimrod through the virgin birth. Therefore, they said, father and son were one, which is where Christianity gets it from. Um, there is Queen Semiramis in New York Harbor holding the flame of Nimrod. It's all Babylonian symbolism. And this is uh, an island on the River Seine in Paris, just down from where Diana was killed. Again, a mirror image of the Statue of Liberty. Why? Because it's Semiramis coming up through France and through the empires across to America. These, this is the, the background. This is the the hidden hand behind which the movie protects it from exposure. Um, in Dealey Plaza, when um, 
They killed Kennedy uh, just over the back there off the grassy knoll. The Scottish Rite of Freemasonry put up an obelisk, again, big time uh, streak of society symbolism, and on the top they put a lighted torch. We killed him, we're showing you, but you can't see it, can you? And when they buried him in Arlington Cemetery, they had the eternal flame, the lighted torch, the, the flame of Nimrod, the illuminated ones, on the grave. On top of the Pont Dalma tunnel where Diana died, where people go to take their tributes, is a massive and exact replica of the flame held by the Statue of Liberty. They also symbolized uh, Samiramis, uh, sorry, uh, Nimrod in Babylon as a, a candle, a flame, which you find all across the religions and Satanism. So then we come to Tammuz. Tammuz and Jesus and Horus, who are like Nimrod and Osiris, Mary and Isis and all the rest of it. This is, um, this is a, the difference between Horus and Jesus. Fantastic differences. Um, Jesus was the light of the world. Horus was the light of the world. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. Horus said he was the truth, the life. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Horus was born in Anu, the place of bread. Jesus was the good shepherd. Horus was the good shepherd. Seven fishers bought a boat with Jesus. Seven people bought a boat with Horus. Jesus was the lamb. Horus was the lamb. Jesus identified with the cross. Horus was identified with the cross. Jesus was baptized at 30. Horus was baptized at 30. Jesus was the child of a virgin Mary. Horus was the child of the virgin Isis. The birth was, of Jesus was marked by a star. The birth of Horus was marked by a star. Jesus was the uh, child temp teacher in the temple. Horus was the same. Jesus had 12 disciples. Horus had 12 followers. Jesus was the morning star. Horus was the morning star. Do you think by any chance they might be connected? <laughs> Esoteric advanced knowledge. Prison religion. It's real. It's literal. Take it. Or you won't go to heaven. And uh, this is the story that's gone through history. This is uh, Mithra, who was uh, worshipped by the Romans and others just before Jesus emerged as his successor. Born on December 25th, died to save our sins. He was the good shepherd and the vine, all the old story, uh, all through um, history. Uh, Jesus is the light of the world, yes, because Jesus, like Mithra and the others, was symbolic of the sun, which is the light of the world. What they used to do was um, use this symbol with the cross in the middle and at the, at the point of the winter solstice they used to say that the sun, that one in the sky, had been born or born again or, or rather had, had, had started its cycle to the, you know, the strength uh, in the summer, the, winter, the uh, summer solstice and they moved it around and they followed it around and they symbolized it as the, the life of a man. When he was born around the winter solstice, uh, what we now uh, call December the 25th, that kind of area, um, it, he got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and then at the peak of his powers at the winter solstice, or the summer solstice rather, they symbolized him as a massively strong man with long golden hair, symbolic of the fierce rays of the sun at that time of the year. As uh, he came down into the house of Vir Virgo the Virgin, into the fall or autumn as we call it, um, he was symbolized as having his hair cut short because the rays of the sun were getting less and less powerful and he lost his strength. And then when he got round to the winter solstice again, he um, was symbolized as what we would call old father time, a, a tired old man about to um, come to the end of his life as the sun got to the lowest point of its power in the northern hemisphere. Three days after that point, which is, became our December the 25th, uh, they said that the sun was born to start the cycle again. This is why these sun gods, Mithra, etc., invariably were given the birth date that became our December the 25th. And of course, the long golden hair, cut short, losing strength, that's the story of Sam Sun. Sam the Sun. Esoteric code, Samson was a real man. This is how they did it. This is how they've done it. This is how they've trapped us. Now that symbol of the circle and the cross you find all over the place. It's a big symbol of the Illuminati. That's in the, uh, the square around the Ritz Hotel where Diana left to die. And uh, that's the, uh, the sun king of France. 
That's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Illuminati set up by them to centralize military power, cross and the circle. Then you have the CIA, the cross and the, the sun uh, around it. Uh, this is in the city of London, opposite St. Paul's Cathedral. The black sun, reverse symbolism. Uh, and, of course, all the, the astrological signs around it. And that uh, face was supposed to be a depiction of Winston Churchill. Appropriate, some may say. Even in the um, street plans of the major Illuminati cities, this symbolism is put in there. Not just because they're having a laugh, but because it does something to the energy field and there, therefore affects the people living in it. This is the epicenter of the uh, street plan of a major Illuminati city, Paris, and there's the Arc de Triomphe, and going off from that circle are 12 streets. Of course there are, exactly as they planned it. And even in this example, on the street, they've got the rays of the sun on the road around the circle with the cross going through the Arc de Triomphe. Everywhere they put their symbolism. Um, Talking of this man who's become even more famous now, um, Leonardo da Vinci, he painted this famous painting of uh, Jesus. and uh, He was an esoteric initiate of some uh, standing, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And he symbolized that symbol that I've just shown in this picture. There you have Jesus in the middle with the, uh, the halo. And, and I'll show you in a second, what the ancients used to do is if they were depicting a sun god, not a literal person, a sun god, they would put a halo around his head. And he's broken up, da Vinci, the twelve disciples into four sets of three. The uh, four seasons, the twelve months of the year, etc. And the esoteric uh, astrological signs. And here is that same painting outside the entrance to that Freemasonic temple where I was sitting in the, the throne thing because they understand what that actually means and it's nothing to do with Jesus. Here's the sun god Bell on a standing stone depicted with a halo around his head to show it was a sun god. Um, a bell, and again, we talk about the Phoenicians and the phonetics. So the way a word sounds is far more important to the Illuminati than the way it's spelled. And so something like Bell can be symbolic of, of Bel, the sun god. Um, another thing that you find uh, symbolizing these gods, which right through the present day, is the rising sun. Uh, they were symbol, that was a symbol of Nimrod, Tamos, and uh, Horus, and other people as well. Christ has risen. Yeah, like the sun rises every morning. This is where this stuff comes from, I would suggest. Um, the phoenix... Em uh, an emblem of the rising sun. The house of the rising sun is something you come across a lot. Um, and it's all uh, depicting the same basic uh, theme. Now, George Washington, this high Freemason and aristocratic bloodline, had a famous sun chair, which was the sun coming up over the horizon. Horus and uh, Tamus and this recurring theme, this deity. In the, that uh, temple in Boston, the rising sun. Um, the rising sun you find on many seals of states in the United States. Illinois is not famous for its sun, but there's the rising sun again. It means something to the secret society initiates who put it together. Now, this is Downing Street. I didn't realize until I saw the, this blown up picture that Downing Street actually has the rays of the sun. I thought it was just that. But it's the rays of the sun, symbolic of this recurring secret society uh, theme. We own the place. We're showing you can't see it. Now, what a coincidence that uh, on the Illuminati-owned NBC uh, network in America, there you have the same thing. Because they own the media so that they can, they can feed us the false reality, which makes us, as I'll get to at the end of the talk, um, create a false experience. This is the Mormon church, wholly owned uh, subsidiary, again, as I said, of the Illuminati, and you find the rising sun all over its symbolism in its temples. The Jesuits, the rising sun, this massively important strand within the Illuminati and connected to the Roman church. Why the, all the sun all the time? Illumination. Um, and one of the most famous strands of the Illuminati was known as the Bavarian Illuminati which was created, at least on, uh, on the face of it, by a guy called Adam Weishaupt, who was 
uh, educated as a Jesuit, an organization started by Ignatius Loyola there, and they used to call themselves the Illuminated Ones. And uh, it seems to be quite a thing because Clinton was educated in a Jesuit setting. So was Mugabe, so was Pierre Trudeau, a horrendous Satanist and abuser of people. Um, William Bennett, ditto uh, in America. Uh, William Casey, head of the CIA. John Kerry, who went against um, a fellow secret society initiate the last election, Bush. Um, all brought up in this Jesuit background. It's a really, really important uh, strand in the Illuminati. And what I'm talking about in this first section, to sum up um, this, uh, uh, what do they call them? I was going to say, say LP, they don't have them now, CD, whatever it is, the Rolling Stones. They are bridges to Babylon. This is where this network came from and it's expanding itself globally and that's what the hidden agenda is going on. Something like Christmas, that goes back to Babylon. I won't go into it too much now because I want much to get to. But that comes out of Babylon and their symbolism. And of course Santa is an anagram of Satan uh, uh, somehow. Uh, one of the things they used to do, they said that um, uh, Nimrod was symbolized when he died as a, a dead tree trunk the night before what we call Christmas, and the next day he'd grown into a massive evergreen tree and they just put gifts on them. Uh, the Yule log, child log, goes back to Babylon. Um, Ishtar said that she came to earth in an egg. That's why we have the Ishtar egg. They used to have the same uh, s ceremony. Tammuz, Tammuz um, was uh, said to uh, be a great lover of rabbits. That's where we get the Easter bunny from. Our whole society is based on this stuff. They used to have things like cross, cross, cross buns. Um, Tammuz was said to have been killed by a wild pig. Therefore, um, they symbolized his death every year by eating pig. That's where we get the Easter ham from. In uh, America, it's used more. The period of Lent, a mirror of what happened in Babylon in relation to Tammuz. Everywhere you see this recurring theme. Then there's these <coughs> secret codes all around us, the skull and bones. The skull and bones, the Templars were accused of having skull and bones in their ceremonies when they were um, attacked and uh, apparently uh, removed, but not quite so, in 1307 when uh, Philip the Fair did his stuff. And because of this Illuminati skull and bones symbolism, we have the most famous secret society in America called the Skull and Bones Society. I've, I've been here. It's a horrible bloody place um, opposite Yale University. And who are initiates of the Skull and Bones Society? Father George Bush, who um, produced Boy George Bush. At the last election, at any time, there are a few hundred Skull and Bones members alive. In America, like I said, there's the best part of 300 million people. At the last election, statistically, what are the chances? We had two initiates of the Skull and Bone Society contesting the presidential election. Why? Because it was fixed to happen that way. And when um, Bush was asked by one television journalist only about the Skull and Bone Society, he said on camera, it's too secret to talk about. And I'm not kidding. And the interviewer then went on to the next question. I'm like, excuse me, what do you mean it's too secret to talk about? You're the president. You want to be the president? Oh, no. Oh, no. How are the kids? What? That's how it goes. There you go. That's a lovely one. Vote for us. You mean me? Yeah. They're just different aspects of the same thing. Same here, look. What we got here? Same. This is a, 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 an Illuminati symbol that goes way back into the ancient world. Uh, the all-seeing eye on the pyramid, uh, top of the pyramid, the capstone, raised above the rest of the pyramid. It symbolizes the power, the all-seeing eye, controlling the rest of the pyramid in that way that I've been describing earlier on. And you find this all over the place. What that... Uh, those words actually say are words to the effect of he favors our undertaking new order of the ages. New world order is one of the uh, theme phrases of this whole uh, conspiracy. You'll see it in, in advertisements in Illuminati families and companies and stuff like that. And when the Pentagon, only recently, 
um, decided that we're going to have an awareness office to feed even more disinformation into the public. Um, this is the symbol they chose for that information awareness office, exactly uh, from the drawing board of the Illuminati. British intelligence, just down the bloody road from here, isn't it, somewhere? I'm not sure about the intelligence bit, but there we go. M. I-5, Military Intelligence 5. Uh, the, there's the, the eye on the top of the pyramid, and those uh, fleur-de-lis in the crown, by the way, the fleur-de-lis is an ancient symbol of the Merovingian bloodline. <coughs> the secret um, societies interconnect with the intelligence agencies as part of the web, and uh, <coughs> that's why they provide the evidence to go to wars that the Illuminati want to fight, and then we find it wasn't evidence at all. There you go, pyramid with a capstone missing, MI-6. Uh, this is Dealey Plaza where they killed Kennedy. Again, the street plan is um, a pyramid with a capstone missing. And this, is an, this was an important area right from the start in Dallas. It was the site of the first Freemasonic temple in Dallas. That river just at the top there is called the Trinity River. Again, Trinity, Samiramis, Nimrod, Tammuz. CBS, Columbia Broadcasting, eye on the screen all the time. The uh, all-seeing eye. That's uh, Mormon temple, all-seeing eye. Then there's the, uh, the obelisk, again, and the church steeple. This is, this is the phallic symbol. This is the, the, the thing that um, Isis couldn't find, and Samiramis couldn't find, in Nimrod and, and Osiris. Uh, the, the phallic symbol, it symbolizes to an extent the bloodline. And uh, you find them all over the place. That's the George Washington Freemasonic Memorial. Again, the phallic symbol. And the biggest... Um, uh, obelisk in the world is in Washington DC, the Washington Memorial. I say the biggest obelisk because it's not the biggest dick in the world. He's just down here in a little white house. You know, he's a, there's no problem. So, as I'll get into this afternoon, just because two people are fighting each other doesn't mean that they're not uh, being controlled by the same force. The Nazis fought the apparently anti-Nazis in the Second World War, but the Nazis were connected to the same group because the war brought about massive global change, which is what it was designed to do. So you find this Nazi, he's got the bloody set, this bloke. There's the uh, Knights of Malta symbol, there's the skull and bones, there's the, uh, the swastika, and there's the eagle, which replaced the, in, in their symbolism the phoenix as uh, Illuminati symbolism in things like places like America. Um, and also, symbolism means something. When I talked about the law being controlled and not being as we thought it was, uh, just quickly, um, when I first went to America, I kept seeing these flags in federal buildings and court buildings, and they had bloody gold fringes around them. And I'm thinking, what the sod in hell is this about? The flag doesn't have a gold fringe about. And then I realized later what it meant. What they've done is years and years ago, they had something, which is still going today, called the International Law of the Flags. And what that said, this was the time when there was a lot of um, uh, trading in, in ships and stuff. And what they said was, if you enter a ship, you look at the flag that's flying, and you come under the jurisdiction of the law of that flag, whatever country it is, or whatever entity it is. What they did then, is they brought this law ashore. And they started putting the gold fringe around the American flag in American courts and in American federal buildings and schools and all this stuff. And so you ask the next question, so what in the international law of the flags does the gold fringe depict? It depicts British maritime law, which is known in America as the universe, uh, uniform commercial code. It is the law of contracts, and we are contracting with what is in effect a corporation without knowing it. When you get a driving license in America, you are contracting with the corporation operating out of Washington, D.C., which is not the government of America, it's a private corporation. And it's operating under the law of contracts, which is why it puts a gold fringe around every flag that is in a building that represents its power. You go into a court in America, you'll see behind the judge every time a flag with a gold fringe around it, 
And the people in the court think they're being tried under the constitutional law of America. No, no, they're being tried under the law of contracts. The judge can do what he bloody well likes. Because you've contracted with him by entering the court. You don't know that, but you have. And this is how this whole thing works. And it's interesting when you uh, go to the uh, soldiers in Iraq, the United States Armed Forces, they have got a gold fringe around the American flag. They're not representing the people of America, they're representing the corporation based in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> not only that, reverse symbolism. They put the stars on the other side of the flag. Oh, he's, 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 he's things wrong in here. Oh, don't worry about it. I'm sure there's an explanation for it. Yes, there is. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to have a break now very shortly, but I want to whip through this um, before we, we get to the present day and really kind of go with what's happening now. But at the uh, entrance to... Uh, the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in London, you have the reverse pentagram pointing in. And uh, this is something you find in uh, the streets of many cities, not by accident. Again, we keep coming to the Mormon church. The Mormon church, and I, I say this, that the vast majority of Mormons compartmentalize pyramids, keep them in the shit and feed them bullshit, or keep them in the dark and feed them bullshit. Most Mormons, while I disagree with their religion, have not a clue what the Mormon church is really about. What it is, is a satanic ritual cult at the core, um, beyond the knowledge of the vast majority in it. And this is why you find these classic symbols all over the Mormon church. Uh, the reversed uh, pentagram, which you find in Satanism, all over the place in uh, the temple in Salt Lake City. This is the street plan of Washington, D.C. This is uh, uh, the uh, White House, and this is the uh, Capitol Hill building, and the roads going off create a pentagram, a reverse pentagram. Another way that they symbolize the negative is to take a balanced symbol and then distort it to make imbalance. Imbalance is what they want. And if you go through the center of this street, I think it's 16th Street, from the White House through this pentagram of streets, somewhere here you find a very unusual building in Washington. I'll come to that in a second. I uh, just forgot to tell you. The center of a pentagram, um, pentagram is a pentagon. And that's why we have the center of the uh, military in a building called and shaped as a pentagon. So through that middle of that 16th Street, you find this building. It's like something out of Egypt or the ancient world. And here you have the s symbolism of the Sphinx in their own way here outside. Uh, and this building is the supreme headquarters, 33rd degree Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Um, and behind those pillars, and it's brilliant when you see it live, I took these pictures myself, you have the sun coming up over the horizon. The classic uh, recurring symbol through the ages of the Illuminati and its secret society network. And that is down the road from... Uh, the White House. And the Freemasons will tell you, oh no, we only became Freemasons in like the 1600s, 1700s when we took off over from the Masonic Lodges. Please, not even they believe that. This is a picture from that, uh, inside that Boston Freemasonic temple. And they show that they take their history right back to the ancient world, right through to the present day. As it says underneath, friend to friend from centuries past through centuries to come. Exactly. The Rosicrucians, again, uh, ancient Egyptian symbolism. This is where it all came from. This is um, apparently a political building, uh, the Capitol Hill building. In fact, it is a temple to a secret society network. It's not a political building at all. And it's based on this place, St. Paul's Cathedral, in the center of, 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 in so many ways, a major epicenter of the global manipulation, the city of London. Um, it became known as Capitol Hill because um, when the Illuminati were in Rome, they had a sacred place called Capitoline Hill, which had a temple on it. And uh, Madeleine Albright went there on a, on a visit when she became Secretary of State in the Clinton administration. That's where it comes from. It's all historic and uh, passing the same themes through history. Now, I'm going to just finish on this before we have a break. 
Satanism, child abuse, mind control, they're all part of the same uh, connected uh, attack and the same themes of ritual that go through the ages. Like I say, you know, you look at these people on CNN and the BBC in their dark suits um, and in their fancy bloody <sighs> jewelry and crowns and stuff, and they seem to be like, oh, the bastion of society. I talk very good, you know, where are the rights of all, you say? Wear all the right clothes, you know. And if you could see what they get up to behind the scenes, it would make you uh, sick to the core. And I've talked to people all over the world, um, in endless different countries, uh, people who were little kids at the time, who've been subjected to the horrors of these people. So when people say to me, oh, they'd never kill their own people on 9-11, oh, well, they wouldn't have meant to kill all those kids in Iraq, you are having a laugh. They get fun out of it. To them, it's a ritual. And one of the things that I find with these people, um, I'll get into this more later on, I think, if I've got time, is they speak through their eyes. They're people who have the fake smile, the fake emotion, who no matter what their face is doing, it might be laughing, the, ex the uh, extended smile, the eyes never change. They're always fixed and cold. Who could I be thinking of? One example of this stuff is a place called Bohemian Grove in um, America. It's about 75 miles north of San Francisco. Uh, this is where the so-called elite go every year. Usually it's in like July time to have week or 10 days um, having a rest from the cares of the world. 